Welcome to this week's episode of The Conversation, where my guest today is Leodora Darlington, the publishing director at Orion Books. And she's also the founder of Own Voices, which is an organisation that has the aim of bringing unheard voices to mainstream audiences. In today's episode, we talk about the submissions process from the point of view of an editor, if she's able to see trends in publishing before, well, before they become a trend, the time that she said no to an amazing job, taking ownership of being good at her job and of her success. You will find the links for Leodora Darlington in the show notes. And as Columbo would say, just one more thing. If you'd like to sponsor an episode of The Conversation, then feel free to email me at theconversation at nadinematheson.com. Now sit back, go for a walk and enjoy the conversation. Leodora Darlington, welcome to The Conversation. Great to be here. (laughs) Right, my first question for you, because you're the publishing director at Orion. What motivates you? Oh, that is a good question. I think for me, it's, I'll be, I'll be totally transparent. I'm quite commercial. I like to make my author's money. <laughs> so actually being able to make my, making my author's money is what really motivates me and sort of seeing something sell really well. Like there's nothing, there's no better buzz really. So that's me. I think, you know, more broadly speaking, I came into this industry with the aim of publishing a really commercial and diverse list and sort of my focus at Orion is going to be finding some new exciting voices to add to the list that I've already taken on um but yeah making authors money is the short version you like that making authors <laughs> money so what brought you into publishing in the first place good question so I do you know at one point I almost went into theatre it was a question of whether I was going to go into acting seriously or publishing I've always I think it's typical stereotypical but I've always loved books and when I yeah. was little, first mum used to read to me, but then when I was still quite small, we'd like read together every day. So I'd read to her, went through all various, you know, series and books. Um, and that really sort of nurtured my love for it. But yeah, when I finished uni, I went to New Zealand for a month, came back, was really poor. <laughs> I was like, I need any job. <laughs> and I come from a family of teachers. So I knew that I could probably like do a learning learning support assistant job for a while. Um So I started that and used sort of that time to figure out what I really wanted to focus on. I did a master's in creative writing. That's a really long winded explanation. (laughs) I did an MA in creative writing and one of the modules was about um, using creative writing in the workplace. And as part of that, I actually designed own voices. That's way back when I first thought about the own voices workshop. And it's because I read a report by Spread the Word, the Writing the Future report. I don't know if you've read it. I did. Did it? Did it come out during lockdown? That was their, their follow-up one. So they that did another follow one up. a few years before that. Right. So actually, I could have just said, it was a spread the word report, really, that hammered it home for me. I thought, wow, you know, it's an industry in which not a lot of people feel represented. It's not necessarily catered to everyone in the way it should be. It felt like there was a very obvious or a wide open space for me to step into. And yeah, I've been on a crazy roller coaster ride ever since. <laughs> did you know that, publishing was open was open to you as a career like way back when when you was at university was that ever presented as an option do you know what (laughs) yes well actually yeah I think I was quite lucky so I went to at university we didn't discuss it but I went to a grammar school in Kent I traveled all the way from Croydon every day (laughs) um and I remember we had like a careers advisor and they'd always send well I think when we're in year 10 or something they send you off to talk about work experience and because it was quite a a post school (laughs) they knew (laughs) someone at a publisher so I got some work experience at Egmont at the time when I was about 15 so I knew publishing existed that was a very different beast um to the first publishers I joined it was very traditional children's YA um so I sort of knew it existed and that was helpful, I guess. But I think for a lot of people, they don't even really know it's an option. Yeah. Um, I feel that way about, I think a lot of the, well, maybe not the best. I think a lot of jobs are sort of invisible unless you sort of are in the know. But that's a whole other conversation I could start ranting about. So. You can rant, we don't mind a rant. <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad I found it. When you spoke to your your parents, you said you come from a family of teachers. Mm. What was their response to you in terms of when you said publishing is where I want to go? 
do you know what I mean oh, this is actually a bit of a sad moment by the time that I started working in publishing my mum had sadly passed away already and my dad's a bit of a shit so he's not around <laughs> so actually I mean I think she probably would have been mm, she was always incredibly supportive so I think she would have been nothing but enthusiastic but I do remember my mum always used to say to me um like never be the first black person anywhere you work because <laughs> she was a teacher and a lot of the schools she worked yeah. in had never had a black teacher before um and I hadn't really thought about that when I joined publishing. I was like, oh, I mean, I think I've been quite lucky in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, it's an industry that's still got some some ways to go when it comes to diversity and inclusion. <laughs> yeah, I remember reading one of these reports and it must have been during lockdown because all of a sudden all these reports started suddenly flying mm. out of nowhere. And it was um, one of the one of the parts of the report was about, you know, um, access to your first access to a black teacher Mm. And I thought mine wasn't, it's, I can do it two ways. It was traditionally, I didn't mm. have a black teacher until I got to secondary school. Yeah. That was Mrs. Goring, my Spanish teacher, mm. when I was 11. But I say non-traditionally, we used mm. to go to a Saturday school. Oh, yeah. So it's like, you know, Caribbean, African run, Saturday school. Worst mm. thing being, you know, being nine years old and being told, get up on a Saturday, you've got to go to school. <laughs> you know, I've already done school yeah. this week. <laughs> But on a Saturday, we had obviously black teachers and teaching mm. us extra, extra maths mm. and English. So, and then I was reading this week, I was on LinkedIn. <laughs> Not <laughs> I was on LinkedIn, but I was on LinkedIn. And there's a barrister I know, and I think he just became the first head of the, I can't remember if it's the Northeastern Circuit. Mm. But Ooh. in it, there was a quote from him. No, it was, I think it was in the Times. And there was a quote from him saying, you know, I'm fed up of being... I don't want to hear that I'm the first black. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. That's so funny. I mean, I'm sure I'd be curious to hear more about your experience, both as a black crime writer, but also working in the legal profession. Because mm. I remember like having a careers day at school and they'd have some lawyers come in and my mum was like sort of taking me around the stairs and she sat down in front of them and how many black people work there? And they're like, ah! <laughs> none. <laughs> yeah, what has it but, been like for you? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but that's something you like you, you did when you were younger or your, or your parents did or your family members did if you ever approached involved any kind any anywhere new you'd mm. look to see how many black people or people of color are in the room mm. um but I think it was interesting I say for me like growing up there weren't any I don't think there wasn't anyone in my family who were solicitors or barristers but mm. my cousin Sandra who's I think she's, I think she's two years young two three years younger than me we both were like the first ones to do to do law and, mm. to, and we both became solicitors and mm. we were like the only one but I was I think what surprised me is that when I did first start going to court I was surprised at the number of black solicitors and Asian mm. solicitors and Chinese solicitors I was mm. just surprised at the number there were because there were loads but it was odd, like we wasn't aware of it mm. but no one mm. came to our school and said this is what you can do and, yeah. and this is who I am. And I don't I don't understand why that was. So I was surprised that there were, you know, that I wasn't just the first one. Mm. Um, mm. But then when you'd get into court and you'd look at the judges, mm. um, <laughs> yeah, there, there weren't any. I didn't, I think I, I think the only time I saw a black judge, I think I went out of London, I went to an out of London court. Mm. I think that was the first time I saw a black man sitting on the bench. Mm. as a judge and there still wow. aren't yeah there still aren't that many and I spoke mm. to um Nicola Williams the crime writer and barrister mm. and she, she also sits as a judge um you know and it's a black woman and she says she's still there, there's not that many mm. like you can count them on <laughs> both hands yeah which is crazy <laughs> it is so wild. in a sense it's yeah it, it's wild and it's on one hand, you know, when someone, when you hear, oh, they're the first black, you're like, oh, okay, cool. But on the other hand, you're like, but why now in 2023 are we still having yeah. the first? Anything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. I mean, I think even within publishing, now I've made this a publishing round, which I didn't, again, mean to. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, um, I don't know if you've heard about the Black, I need to say it right, Black Agents and Editors Guild, which was set up by yeah, Marianne, my, who's yeah. actually director over at Penguin. Um but I think for ages I'd been like, oh, you know, I'd really love to see, you know, which other black commissioners are out there, commissioning editors are out there. So when she set that up, great. But I was still looking through a list and be like, well, who is the other black 
commercial editor of commercial fiction mm. at all. <laughs> and it's great because we have Sarita at um at Trapeze who yeah. does it does commission some commercial stuff, but I think it's slightly more in a book club space. Essentially, there just didn't seem to be literally anyone but me in the entirety of the UK, <laughs> which in 2023, not amazing. And I mean, it, the last time I checked this was two years ago, so that might have changed and might be changing. Yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's still shocking to see how much progress there is to be made. In, in Why do you... Part. I know I feel like I'm putting I'm putting a like so you know so world hunger question on you. (laughs) Why do you think it's so there is so little? I think part and parcel of it is what you were just touching on there in terms of not having visibility over these jobs existing. Like if I hadn't gone to the school that I'd gone to, and already the school I went to was let's let's be clear, there were four black people in the year fortunately three of us were in the same class so they're still my best friends to this day um but I think you know certain I think the more privileged you are the more likely you are to know that these things exist um and I think that visibility like you can't be what you what you can't see first and foremost then even if you do find out the industry exists you know if you look at the industry and you see zero commercial fiction black commissioners like does that necessarily feel like a space for you I, I think I'm glad I didn't check before I joined because <laughs> I don't know if I still would have um but I think that's a large part of it and it's interesting it's it's been really great seeing initiatives that Hachette has been running as I understand it there have been sort sort of um so Orion does like a, this Orion on tour thing where it's just about sort of creating more visibility around the publishing industry and mm. making underrepresented groups get to sort of find out what we're doing and um, demystify yeah. things slightly so yeah what do you what do you think I'm sorry I'm throwing it back to you why do you think it might be <laughs> not my conversation no, but... <laughs> I'm interested in your thoughts aren't I? <laughs> you don't have to answer if you don't want to <laughs> no I don't I don't I don't know exactly what it is I mean it does I mean when you say you know you can't be what you can't see that is I mean that is so important and it's so 100% true mm-hmm. because I didn't know there were and it sounds it sounds so naive to say it. I didn't know there were black female British crime writers. Out, there aren't there. that many of you. <laughs> and, but there, there are, but there aren't that many of me. But mm. even when I was just thinking about mm. writing, I still didn't. Mm. I'm a, I know it's only two, but <laughs> that I know. But I didn't know about the two. I didn't know about Nicola and um, Williams writing mm. um, about prejudice back in ninety because we were talking about it back in nineteen ninety six. I think mm. it was. Um, I found Dreda Say Mitchell by, I say by accident, because I was just browsing the bookshelves at mm. WH Smith. And this is back in 2006. Oh, and great. I turned, the, yeah, but I turned the back. Mm. And it's like, oh my God, it's a black woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the cover. And then I read her little profile. And it's like Dreda Say Mitchell, um, family's from Grenada. And I'm like, what? Well, I'm the same, because my family's from Grenada. But I mean, yeah. you know, so you look at the gap, like 1996, 2006. Mm. Mm. So that's two black women in mm. what 20 years and then the other black writers that I knew who wrote I say who wrote crime they were all I knew was Walter Mosley mm. that's an American you know and he's, he's an American mm. well so mm. you didn't feel that that was a world that was open to you mm. Mm. and listen if you don't know that it's open and it's available you how do you know you're going to have access until either you dare to just force your way in there or you suddenly just see this you know there's people popping up but mm-hmm. it's I, I don't I, I haven't quite worked it out yet I don't get it because mm-hmm. it's not as if, as if we don't write mm-hmm. commercial and I mean I said yeah. like we're talking about crime fiction but you know we're talking about you know commercial we're talking you know about mm-hmm. a, like, the romantic comedies and mm-hmm. all you know all sorts so it's... Yeah, I mean, there. Are, I I'm, I feel like publishers are trying to make more of an effort to find more of those voices now. But you're right. I remember actually. So my creative writing course, my MA, which I was very privileged to be able to do. Mm-hmm. But even looking around that room, that was an incredibly diverse group of people, and it's not at all re- like representative what <laughs> who's being published. Yeah. I found that really interesting. Um, because you're right, the talent is out there. I think publishers sort of have 
a duty to make more of a concerted effort to find those voices and that's why wherever I go I usually end up setting up some kind of an initiative for finding underrepresented voices um but also you know I think a large part of it is also that mm, god I'm gonna get myself in so much trouble but you know the agency <laughs> world also isn't very diverse and for most publishers if you're only taking agented submissions and mm. most of the people reading those you know the initial what people call the slush pile are posh middle class white people who are then identifying with posh middle class white stories those are what they're buying and then that's what yeah. they're sending to publishers the publishers you know often don't see a lot of material that perhaps could have been great because it doesn't resonate with that you know precise agent and it's not necessarily the agent's fault she says with a question mark in her voice but I think just also finding a, a, bro- a broader breadth that breadth of agents I think is what's going to sort of help with <laughs> finding more of that you know broader breadth of talent too. How do you make say young I'll say young writers but just you know writers of colour Mm. How do you make them more aware of how they can gain access to the publishing world or actually to become published? Mm. I think those kinds of things are like various initiatives. Again, like Orion's running like own voices um, where you sort of open up the doors to then sort of run Q&A panels. I think those Q&A panels tend to be really handy. Whenever I've run something like that, the number of responses I get after going like, wow, I didn't know this. It was so useful. It's really great. Um, there are lots of organisations like Spread the Word who are also doing some great things in that vein. Uh, but I think the more of those sort of events that you can hold. I mean, I, again, I think I'm quite conscious that we have a lot of conversations about burnout in our industry and a lot of editors and editorial teams feel burnt out and it feels like another thing to do. But it's important. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who are sort of willing to do that work despite having a lot of work to do. Do you think, it's, think, impo- it's, do you think it's important now for, say, publishers and I suppose agents as well to get out more into the community because when I've done the festivals yeah because when I'm sorry I thought I've cut you but when when I started going to festivals first as a I don't know what to call myself audience member I don't know but when you first go there I think the first one I went to was in 2018 and I only went and I'd never been to one before I went to crime fest that was the first one I went to um, and I think I went to Killer Women, but then I'd only started going to these festivals because I was doing a creative writing master's that mm. specialised in crime and thriller writing. Mm. But I'd been reading crime and thrillers since I was, I say, since I was thirteen, probably earlier than that. But I wasn't aware of these festivals mm. before that. And then when you do go, you realise, you know, one, you know, you got to buy a ticket. Then you've got to pay for transport, then you've got to pay for hotels. So the whole thing can be quite expensive, which is why I think I was saying, do you think agents and publishers should do more to go back, go into the communities? Yeah, I think that kind of outreach would be really useful. I think sort of talks at schools tend to be quite useful in terms of, mm-hmm. like, you know, inspiring young, young minds, but also something that I've noticed people doing quite quietly. And I also think it's quite a good idea. You know, as when you get to a certain level in publishing or actually I think once you're a commissioning editor for sure and you're invited to speak at something often like you'll get off to pay pay the fee and if you can afford to once you're above a certain level I think donating that fee to an underrepresented writer being able to then have a sponsored place on x next talk is really valuable and I'm not going to embarrass certain people by shouting them out (laughs) like for example um to pay some people fees before and in various initiatives that I've run and it's ended up being donated to an author's like an under an underrepresented author's prize and likewise you know if I'm speaking at something more than not that money could actually go to someone else being able to attend yeah. it who might not be able to afford to go but so when you know you founded Own Voices mm. you want to tell us what Own Voices is about Oh, yeah. So it's, you know, it's mostly just me with a little help from my friends. (laughs) But essentially, I set it up as an initiative or an organisation that was aiming to help bring underrepresented voices to mainstream audiences. So it's got to focus on commercial fiction. Um, I've only run a couple of workshops through it, but every year at the moment, I'm running the Own Voices Novel Award, which I started in 2021. I need to sort the announcement for 2023, which is amazing. <laughs> um, but that's been really great. And watching that cohort sort of go on to have successes has been wonderful. So both last year's 
winners have agents, um, one with Curtis Brown and one with Sean Ellis Martin at Blake Friedman. Um, so that's been really wonderful and rewarding. So yeah, I think I'd like to do more with it, but I think again, it's a it's like a slight time thing. Yes, a time thing. <laughs> I think that's the thing. It's like I, last summer I did a couple of um like workshops with like the mm. local colleges, and then I did one with like the secondary school students, mm. and I get I mean it's a bit selfish to say like I get so much out of it. Yeah, but just by seeing the students, you know, especially when they're like 15, 16 years of age, but then realizing that oh my god, like you're a writer, you're from the mm. same area that I'm from mm. and you're published and you're actually listening to me and listening mm. to my ideas and, you know, mm. I have them, like, plan out a story and do, you know, do little things Amazing. like that. And you see how creative they are and it's just having that encouragement to say, you yeah. know, you can go further with it. Careful, I'm going to end up roping you into Simone Voices initiative. <laughs> Keep talking like that. <laughs> It's just, it's just the time thing. It's like you'd want to yeah. do it all, all the time. Mm, but, um, <laughs> yeah, but, it's, but it's, it's, just, it's, what, it's what we were saying earlier. Now, you can't be what you can't see. Once they can yeah. see you, they're like, oh, actually, I can I can do this mm. too. And I said, it's, I said, always say people want to be heard. Um, and once yeah. they see they're being heard, they're like, oh, okay, they open up a little bit more. Um, your, oh, your authors on your own voices when they're at the workshop and things, mm. what are they most surprised about when it comes to publishing and the whole journey to becoming a writer? Oh, that is a good question. What are they most I have those. surprised about? <laughs> like, I think sometimes people are quite surprised by the timelines in publishing. Um, mm. You know, I think once you've written a book, it feels like, hey, great, this is done. And then realising, okay, you might write a book and, okay, then it might take a couple of, months to find a publisher and then a few more months to edit and then you have to think about the production timeline so yeah you might deliver a book and then it's not coming out for a couple of years I think that was quite a big shock um that's been quite a big shock to some of the authors what else have they found surprising Mm, I mean because I've got quite a lot of digital experience I think talking through what digital publishing looks like has been quite a revelation for a lot of authors I think there's sometimes a bit of a perception that well you know, a good digital publisher is just ask what sort of looking for, just a sort of thorough with their editing and this, yeah. you know, committed and dedicated a publisher as a trad publisher, sometimes more so, um, you know, a good digital publisher that is. And I think that's been quite surprising for authors in, t- in terms of also how much money you can make. And not that I'm pitching, I need to be careful that I'm not pitching digital <laughs> publishing very specifically. Um, but yeah, there's also some nice money to be made in it because of the royalty splits, but, you know, also learning where those differences lie in terms of you know digital publishing you're not usually going to get publicity um whereas you can get these really amazing publicity campaigns at a trad publisher and I think they found that sort of stuff really curious too what are you looking for as a commissioning editor when you get a, a manuscript pops up in your email what are you looking for oh as if and what would make me buy something that I've already received yeah, uh, yeah. it's got to have a great standout hook and I tend to I try and um, make a point of writing some sort of what I'm looking for guidelines when I'm running my own voices but I think regardless any submission I receive it's got to have a really strong one-line pitch and the voice has to be compelling you know it's got to feel like a confident if that makes sense Mm. and I've got to just want to keep turning the pages I think those are the biggest things you know I'm not an editor that's afraid of rolling my sleeves up on a on an edit and I mean I guess because actually it's the author who has to do most of the work (laughs) but structurally it's much easier to fix oh maybe this twist doesn't quite work and maybe actually we need to bring this character up a bit or maybe we need to move this and that but if at line level the writing isn't delivering or the hook itself isn't going to pull readers in that's much much harder to fix if that makes sense again hook is something you can work on with an author but that line level compelling quality has just got to be there it's interesting because you know by the time it's submitted to you it's Mm. already been it's already gone to an agent who's Mm. read it Mm. and they've decided it's good enough they've Mm. met the author and said they want I want to represent this author and I think Mm. I think this is good enough to be published and they send Mm. it to you and then you then read it and you may think you're not seeing what they're seeing do they ever come back to you the agents because we, oh. no, we don't hear about that middle bit, that process, when you're the author. It just... As in, do agents, if, if we turn something down, do agents then re- reply, 
Yeah, after, after because that. you know they, because they, yeah, because they thought it's because they thought it's good enough to send to you, and they've taken your yeah. for on. Do you know what? I think this is the thing. I think actually the quality bar tends to be pretty high at a trad publisher because we're only seeing agented submissions. The line level writing is mm. usually pretty strong. I think it's there's just right, submissions are so subjective. Yeah, but I think we all learn to sort of try not to be too precious about it because it might just be that yes this one line pitch is amazing but for my personal taste I'd like a writing style that's less reflective to go alongside it whereas for another editor they love the pitch and actually they want something that feels like a little bit more of a slow burn or they like it when there's a lot of introspection and characters thoughts it's just so subjective that I think if anything probably for an agent I mean every agent is different in how much editorial work they do but you know, they know that ultimately different editors will have different things they like and, and yeah. don't like. So, yeah, I don't tend to, I don't, I can't remember having an agent go back to me and say, well, actually, I, I think you're wrong. Although when I have been reading unagented submissions, I have occasionally had an author say, actually, <laughs> I think it's a mistake to understand. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do in those circumstances? <laughs> I'm like, like, what, what can I do? What can you like, do? Okay, what can you okay. Do? okay. Like, <laughs> they're entitled to their opinion the same way I am mine, and it's not going to change anything ultimately. So, I think no. I hope they feel comforted by having you know expressed what they need to express, and and they can hopefully. Yeah. Need I it. think that's a hurdle <laughs> that you don't. It's odd because people probably they'll get sick of me saying this. Is that you know you kind of you know how to submit to an agent, mm. and once you get the agent return your e- reply to your email and say can I have the full manuscript mm-hmm. and then you get to the I want to sign you you kind of think yes I've done it but then you don't mm-hmm. realize there's another hurdle to yeah go through, which is like now yeah. we need to go through submissions and yeah they could they could say no even though I've said yes they could say mm-hmm. no and I think that's a surprise for a lot of you yeah that's such a good point I think the level of rejection in the industry broadly is probably quite surprising I think as yeah you're right as an author you know when you're submitting to agents or when your agent is submitting to publishers it's there's an element of yes people some people are going to reject this as an agent you know you feel when you're submitting to publishers yes some publishers are going to reject it as an as an editor you know sometimes you offer on something and then they reject yeah. your offer you know there's a lot oh, of yeah because you've got that side of it as well because yeah. you can get rejected true. as well it's true it's true yeah and how you do know, you deal with that <laughs> Um, it's a good question. Gosh, I was about to say something that sounds like well, I'm going to be very honest. I mean, I think I'm quite lucky in that most of the things that I offer on, I tend to get, <laughs> and sometimes things circle back around. I what I I think what I believe most strongly is that if it if you know an author doesn't pick you or whatever, then it just wasn't the right fit because ultimately. Mm-hmm. And this is a conversation I always have with authors when we're talking about, you know, say I'm interested in making an offer. It's so important to have a conversation. Say, look, what does successful publishing look like to you if they've been published before? Like, what is it about your previous experience that you've really enjoyed? What would you like to see more of? What would you like to see less of? It's so important, I think, to be aligned on vision and to be sure it's the right home. You know, what style of working works for you? So if an author has decided not to go with us, it's because somewhere is just a better fit. And I think that's great because there are so many huge books that do really well I mean I think this is another thing for (laughs) editors sometimes sometimes you pass on something and it goes on to do amazingly and I think there can be a temptation to start kicking yourself and go oh god I should have offered no no you shouldn't have offered because it was that person's vision that was going to drive it to where it needed to be if you didn't have that vision and you didn't have that level of passion it wouldn't have been the success that it was so I think you just kind of have to learn to to let things go with love and believe that things have worked out for the best (laughs) if it's meant for you it will stay yeah it will just go yeah, I think precisely that. <laughs> Are you able to predict te- trends? Or can you see trends emerging in publishing? <sighs> mm. <laughs> I think I think people love to try to predict trends. And I think some people might genuinely be very good at it. You could certainly see patterns of what's selling, what's selling more and what's selling less. Mm. And part and parcel of my job is sort of, analyzing a lot of data and thinking oh, okay let's look at how the market has shifted over the past couple of years so I, I guess yes you can I think um for example oh actually I'm not going to go into a whole trends conversation right now but <laughs> I think you can sort of even just by monitoring the the charts right the payback and hardback bestseller charts and like the Amazon Kindle charts you can sort of see what's appearing more often and appearing less frequently um 
I think it'd be tricky to try to, for me anyway, to predict too far in the future what people are going to be buying, which I think is why, again, it's so important when you're as an editor buying a book, that it's just because you really love it and you're really, really passionate about it. Rather, you know, you have to really think about the market. Um, but yeah, I think it's a tricky one. We do have a, a team, actually. Am I allowed to say this? There are like teams that exist in publishing that look at trends and try to predict them. And then they'll like present to editors and be like, hey, I think the circus, I remember this, actually. I remember sitting in a trends meeting a few years ago and they said, I think cir- the circus is going to become a big thing. And I have seen a few circus, circus books being published. Yeah, the circus. Circus, circus. <laughs> yeah, but like the circus in like media. Yeah, the circus, circus, like acrobats and whatnot. <laughs> Your face right now. <laughs> I know, I'm like... <laughs> They can't like, listeners can't see this, they don't need any audio, but I'm literally I'm just staring at the Dora like the what? And I'm thinking but, acrobats and Yeah, yeah. That's what but, I that's what I can see, trapeze. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? I have seen a couple of circus books go up on pre order or published recently. I think on pre I can't remember what, what the book was, but I was like, oh, I remember someone talking about this. Let's see how it does, you know. <laughs> <laughs> has there been, I know we're talking about trends, we don't want to go too much into it, but has there been like a recent trend in publishing that you didn't see coming and you're surprised oh. by how well it's done? Well, I think something I'm definitely noticing a lot more of in submissions is that sort of leaning into a much darker space, that sort of contemporary horror, gothic thrillers thinking a bit Katrina Ward, a bit Francine Toon, mm. a little bit CJ Tudor. Like, a, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of that, like, more than I've ever seen, more than a, a lot of the really? difference that Ryan has been discussing this, yeah, more than ever coming through. Um, and I think historically, like, Wright seems to have seen that it's not necessarily done amazingly in the US, but I've noticed a lot of my US editor contacts have sort of piping up to go, oh, hey, I saw you bought World Rights for this gothic thriller I'd love to read. So that's been really interesting to see, mm. yeah. Is there is there a big a difference between what the US market is looking for in terms of commercial fiction and what the UK market looks for? It's a good question. I think there's some genres in which there's a lot of crossover. I think probably where there's the biggest difference is in how things are packaged and marketed. In the yeah. US, they tend to, even if it's a really commercial book, they do like quite a book clubby upmarket looking jacket. Their packages aren't always quite as what what I like to call Ron Seal, like does what it says on the tin. Um, <laughs> they're definitely a little bit less price sensitive than we are. I think particularly when you're looking at digital and so I've got my digital hat on again, you know, you, when you're looking at the top 100 in the US, the price points are significantly higher than the UK. I mean, I've seen that there are some high price point titles doing quite well. They're usually big brand names in the UK, but often, you know, you're looking at the top 50 and so many of those books are at 99p or 199. That's just not the case in the US, which is, yeah, yeah curious. Mm. <laughs> it's always I, funny comparing I, I, others. <laughs> I know because when it is because when you as an author, when you you know when you do get a foreign deal and you get your US deal, and I remember mm. I was getting my concept covers, the yeah, concepts for the UK cover, at the same mm. time I was getting the concepts for the US cover, and mm. if you know if you go online and you just see they're so completely. So completely different. Yeah, they and are. You 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 can easily just assume they're completely too different. Yeah. Like if you're just going if you're just going by the covers. Yeah, I mean I'm remembering um Jigsaw Man cover and I think have I seen Binding Room, but they, I think again I remember that feeling it looks quite book club to me, you know, but that's just yeah. because it's a different market. It's a br- brilliant cover and it's perfect for their market. It wouldn't that wouldn't sell in the UK, <laughs> you know? No, it's I would just, say they're yeah. just so completely different. I love them both. Like yeah. some of my some of my foreign covers, I was like, oh my god. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, but then I remember my French cover. I even I mean they they won't mind because when they emailed me and they said, What do you think? And I said to them, I had a nightmare <laughs> that <laughs> night after seeing it. And she was laughing. Oh, she was like, really? I said it's a good sign. But then when I looked at the French, like I went, I must have gone on to Amazon up, France. Now. Yeah, <laughs> and I looked at their covers how the French covers are for their crime fiction I thought oh that works for their yeah. market they're much more much more graphic that makes mm. sense for crime it's like if they want, oh, to, if they, want they want to show the horror um mm. the French covers mm. I have a question for you and yeah. it's only because um it's, it's about imposter syndrome 
It's only because yeah. I was listening to I was listening to an Oprah interview. She was interviewing Quinta Bronson. If you ever, if you haven't, it's just, I'm not getting sponsored for this. No one's paying me to say. <laughs> if you ever, you should watch Abbott Elementary. It's so funny. I watched but, it. Um, I've watched yeah, it. Yeah, so she's. Oh, it's so good. It's so Is good. It available Abbott. yet? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think so. <laughs> How did you watch it, Amy? <laughs> We'll move past. We'll move past. We'll be... <laughs> Let's move past. Let's move past. Anyway, I, what I was saying, <laughs> what I was saying is right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me ask the question. So what yeah. I was saying was that she was in. Uh, so Oprah was interviewing Quinta Bronson, mm-hmm. and they both said they'd never suffered from imposter syndrome. So when they yeah. hear people saying they've got imposter syndrome, like, what, like, what is that? What do you mean you've yeah. got imposter syndrome? And like, there's no such thing as failure. So if you fail, it's just, mm. it's a, and I, I mean, I think this, I'm like, yeah, failure is like a, you should learn from it and move yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. It. And it, it, mm. it causes you, to, it forces, it might force you to pivot in some. Yeah. Some yeah. So yeah. It shouldn't be thought of as a negative thing. Obviously mm. at the time it can hurt, but mm. you should move on from it. So do you suffer, have you ever suffered from imposter syndrome or do you believe in it? I think tra- traditionally, not to be honest, with you, tra- traditionally not really. No, I I will say that I think maybe mm, I think probably maybe my in my last couple of jobs it was quite like a dramatic step up, mm. and occasionally I'd find myself at the helm of these really big projects. I think there was at one po- at one point I was when I was at Amazon <laughs> when I was leading a meeting, and I was looking around the well the virtual room at these really senior people. And I was like, <laughs> I really should not be. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know if I should be doing this, but generally, generally speaking, I don't tend to. No, um, I just think there are so many people who aren't actually not. I'm not talking about publishing here specifically. There are just so many people in very senior roles who are actually like, I'm sorry. Can I swear on this? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I can't like just like pretty shit at their jobs, right? I'm sorry if Donald Trump can be president and feel confident with that. I don't have to worry about any job <laughs> I ever do ever again. Like I'm far overqualified compared to everything he's ever done. Um, but I think also like I don't know I been working on my craft for years and I, I just love to learn and be curious I don't know I think imposter syndrome doesn't help help me it wouldn't help me um mm. but yeah I think it's curious I totally understand it I totally understand walking into a room and like I can understand why you'd be like oh god should I be here but I think <laughs> I think sort of having that mentality in this industry as a black woman I wouldn't get anywhere <laughs> Do you, know what yeah. I mean? you have I... to be confident <laughs> Has anyone said to you that, or made, or inferred, why are you here? Do you know why what? do you I have this position, or have you been quite lucky I've in been that regard? Really, really lucky, and no. But do you know what part and parcel of that is? Like, I've been really bloody good at my job. I've sold a lot of books. Yeah. So people know that I've <laughs> sold a lot of books. The first book that I published sold three hundred thousand copies. You know. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm really good. Sorry. Oh my god, I'm gonna come. Off no, you are good at your job. <laughs> No, so but cocky. you know what? I think no, no. But you know what? I think more people should own their successes. Mm. I think sometimes there's a oh, I can't think of the word, but there's a feeling that we need to like humble ourselves mm. slightly mm. and not, mm. you know. I've said it before. My mum always says, like, you know, boast yourself. If you've done mm. something well, mm. why shouldn't you just, you know, say I be proud in saying that I've mm. achieved this? So you know, selling three hundred. You know, one of your authors selling three hundred thousand copies of a book. That is amazing. It's amazing. You know, and now I'm about to do the complete opposite where I like try to talk it down. But you know, there's always an element of luck with these things. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you know what it, it is a fine balance. But I think I'm so conscious. I think this is probably a conversation my had my mum had with me too, particularly when it came to her working in, in her workplace, usually the only black person, the first black person, sorry, I'm talking about, about, about race a lot, but, you know, sometimes when you are that minority voice, you know, you have to be willing to sort of champion yourself in order for people yeah. to take note, note of you. Um, like a lot of people aren't, and I should say that I've been so lucky to find a lot of champions, you know, definitely in my current job and previous jobs, but, you know, you kind of have to give yourself a leg up um, and to be able to com- confidently say, look, I'm here, look at this great work that I'm doing. And then people yeah. will start to take notice. Otherwise, yeah. I think mean, that's no, why I say yes. To, I'm here and I've worked hard to get here. And mm. people like my books. It's mm. good, you know. I've had read, <laughs> readers email and tell me so. And they say nice things. And, you know, Instagram's amazing. When people are just like sharing your book in the most 
basically you just want Aww. a pink car. And yeah, and so you're like, yeah, so I, I own it. And it's like, yeah. So I say yes to lots of things. And I think, you know, a lot of people are saying you were everywhere last year. I'm like, yeah, because I just said yes, yes, yes. I think, yeah, taking opportunities or, you know, making sure you're taking advantage of opportunities when they come through, super important. Yeah. Yeah. I think being proud is a good thing. Being proud of yourself and your accomplishments is a good thing. <laughs> Most definitely. Okay. So, Leodora, I have some questions for you. Ooh. I got all serious like that. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, are you are you an introvert or extrovert or a hybrid of the two? I think I'm a bit of a hybrid. I'm perhaps a little bit more extrovert. It's really interesting. So, I was talking to publishing the other publishing director at Orion fiction Charlotte Mercer about this in fact the whole Orion fiction team we're doing like a personality test um mm. and both Charlotte and I had done it a few years ago and we came out as an introvert it was still a bit of a mix and we did the test again and we both came out as extroverts I think part and part of that is you know when you're an assistant and <laughs> you're junior and everything's a bit more scary I think it's a lot easier for that to influence your personality but I've always been a bit of a combination of two if I'm at home by myself for too many days I will lose my mind I need to <laughs> cabin need... fever yeah I just need to interact yeah. with people yeah what about you well I think I'm a hybrid like <laughs> I, I like I do like being as I said when I said cabin fever there were t- there were times when especially during like lockdown even mm. even though when it was opening up a bit but I was like I've been I've been on my own too long I've been inside too mm. long. I, I need to get out so I can have that like those cabin fever moments but then I have those moments when Right, this weekend, I don't need to see anybody. I just mm, need to just yeah. shut down yeah. and just like, completely zone out and just watch TV and or just do whatever just I want to do. Yeah. But I think I'm a hybrid, but I did one of those tests. Mm, and I don't out? agree. Well, they said I was 75% introvert and 25% oh. extrovert. And I was like, that's bollocks. Sorry. Yeah. But I, just, <laughs> I was like, that's not. But then I thought it comes down to the questions that they mm, asked and I thought well those true, questions true. or the options not even the questions the options they presented to me mm. I was like but those four options that none of them are like me mm. so I don't agree with that <laughs> I did not agree with the 75 percent introvert I'm like yeah. do you know me like, yeah. and I think as well people change mm. you know you know back in my 20s I'm out every single day yeah yeah <laughs> and then like <laughs> no someone's like we want to go out I'm like can I sit down yeah. <laughs> where are we going are they seating because I don't want to be on my feet all night I will quite anyway, happily so... yeah pull up a chair out of the bar like I'll still talk to people and enjoy my drink but I am sitting yeah. down yeah. I'm saying I want to sit down now before yeah. no now I need to sit down okay so what challenge or experience in your life shaped you the most oh god I mean maybe a bit sad but probably my mum passing away you know um because I was re- relatively young when she died about 24 um and because you know it was just me and her I think that was quite a perspective shifting loss because I was like, oh, wow, yeah. like it's like it's just me now. So I think if anything, it sort of made me really pull myself up by my bootstraps. Sometimes people are like, oh, my God, how do you have so much energy to do X, Y, Z? You know, you're so driven to do X, Y, Z. I'm like, well, I don't really have like a, a backup option, you know. You just I, have I, to I, do I, it. Yeah, I kind of have to crack on and do it. Um if I get fired from my job, you know, <laughs> I don't have parents who are going to bail me. I've got no say at my parents' place. I mean, fortunately, that's never come close to happening, I should clarify. But, um, yeah. It's made you aware that, you know, you, you have you. You yeah. have that for you. And I shouldn't be reductive because I have, like, a, like the most amazing friends that you could ever wish for like friends who are like family who I've known for years and years and years and years and also an uncle who's always always kind of been like my dad and like a couple of cousins who live in London who have like yeah been so great in looking after me so I'm you know I shouldn't what's the word I'm looking for minimize the importance and the contribution they bring to my life yeah. but I suppose you know when you don't have that nuclear family there is that slight you know you make make sure that you got yourself girl <laughs> you got yourself. Yeah. did you ever feel like you were missing out on having having a mum, siblings. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. No, having that. <laughs> God, Sorry. it sounds so bad. No, no. But, <laughs> no, but having that traditional nuclear uh, family. I think maybe when I was like, small small but then again I think there's I think it's partly a cultural thing so for example when I was younger like my cousin came to live with us for a while and then also um my mum's just like her, her friend her two daughters came to live with us for a while so there's mm. like there have been people come in and out um 
and god it feels like a really weird flashback but I remember like my half brother coming to stay with us for a while I don't know what that was (laughs) but um so there have always been sort of people coming in and out but yeah I think when I was like small small I was like oh wouldn't it be nice to have a dad and then I was like actually like he kind of sucks (laughs) and I think my mom's doing a really boss job (laughs) I'm really happy with the two of us um yeah you know it's nice to visit families that have that big buzz and be around it for a period of time but yeah I think I was also very lucky with the mum that I had Mm. yeah so god it sounds not god let me get my words out right so the next (laughs) question is if you could go back to when you were 25 years old and give yourself one piece of advice what would it be but what I was going to say is that you know if your mum passing at 24 Then yeah. I'm asking, yeah. No, it's a good question. It is a good question. I think probably to take things a little bit less seriously when it came to work. Like when I was working in a school, the sort of day to day things I was dealing with, like it was for some of these kids, like life and death, like parents mm. trying to murder them and like genuinely. <laughs> and then I came into publishing and I think I, I should have. Like, people say this thing it's just books no one's going to die and I don't know if I internalized that well enough like I just really wanted to be so good at everything and I want to, yeah I want to take this on I want to take this on I want to take that on I want to progress instantly and I think it didn't help that I was offered like a, a junior editor job three months after my first starting as a publishing assistant so then I was instantly like I must I must <laughs> I, I must that, accelerate what did that do to you because you know three months after starting as a publishing assistant and then you're yeah well, I didn't take the job. I was convinced to turn it down. And actually, in the long run, it was really good for me because I learned so much in the three years that followed. But I think just from that point on, I was just so constantly looking forward and so focused yeah. on where I wanted to be that actually everything else was incredibly stressful. Um, and also probably just to drink less and spend less money <laughs> would probably be also some advice <laughs> I would give my... I think every 25-year-old has that. When yeah. you think back, you're like... Yeah, I should have been better with money. I should have yeah. should have been more responsible. Yeah. But you're not thinking about, I mean, at 25, the last thing you're thinking about is pensions and yeah, establishing goodness. that kind of security. I mean, I don't yeah. think Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to like your 30s, you're like, well, maybe I should have done, I should have done something mm. more. Mm. How did you, before we go into like the last, very last question, you know, you said you turned down the job mm. that was offered to you after three months. Mm. What was it inside you that made you turn down an opportunity? Because most people would probably feel, oh my God, I've I've got to take it. Yeah, and to be honest, like it would have been such a fun job. Oh my goodness, it would have been such a fun job. I would have been flying to New York four times a year and coming up with all these great like YA, like fancy stories. It was great. But um, anyway. <laughs> That's what I mean. So you yeah. told people that. They would have been like, you said no to that. Mm. I mean, honestly, the, the, well, the company made a convincing case for me to say they matched the they matched the salary and they were like, look, there's lots of opportunity for you to progress here to like the next level. I mean, I actually ended up not a bit of, you know, progressing to editor level there and moving elsewhere. Mm. But um, what I learned, I mean, I moved up from assistant to executive, but what I learned in that time was invaluable. I should like say shout out to Kesh, who was my first boss and who hired me. She founded Hero Books and she was yeah. just a boss babe and so supportive and nurturing so she commissioned um Angela Marston she discovered her and then like would give me like the manuscripts to read to like edit alongside her and then like really involved me in all the artwork so some of my first um you know publishing work got to be on like Angela Marston's and then there was another really generous um associate publisher called Lydia Vassar Smith who was like hey why don't you help do this like Carol Wire edit with me it's so generous I saw her yesterday she's like oh my god I remember that edit you did in Carol Wire I was like Lydia I feel like you're really overstating like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was amazing but having people like that around me um yeah there was so much opportunity to learn and grow and that's where I commissioned the book that I mentioned that went on to do particularly well so yeah I think the reason I stayed was sort of the opportunity to progress and, you know, the money. <laughs> and I was really enjoying it. I mean, I'm someone who loves to learn and be curious and I'd only just started and everything was so new and interesting and exciting. And yeah, it was learning so much. Long answer, but that's, that's it. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, it's, a good, it's a good answer. It's a good answer. And before we, um, we depart, Oh. Is there anything about, I know, it's so sad. <laughs> Is there anything about like your teaching experience that you learned from there that you were able mm. to transfer to your role in publishing? Do you know what? I think the author care part 
like that it's actually quite a lot of transferable skills because I was dealing with a lot of kids and parents like making sure that we you know in a way I kind of think about books as kind of like an author's baby <laughs> do you know what I mean yeah yeah it's, it's something you create and put out into the world and then suddenly you know this person comes along and decides how to dress it and whatnot and what to change about it like quite a that's exactly it's, what it's like yeah, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um and in the same way I mean like I mean actual children much more significant level of responsibility I should be clear but you know I was looking after people's actual children I think that helped prepare me for looking after people's book babies Mm. um because I think you know reassurance communication all of those things are just so key um so yeah I think that was probably the biggest thing and also having tough conversations right some of the conversations you have to have in public a tough you know um and having learned to have those tough conversations working in a school I think helped I think just be honest I think honesty is kind and I think sometimes people want to skate around delivering the tough news and yeah. that that lack of clarity is actually quite unkind and harmful um so I'm trying to I think a big part of my publishing is bringing across that idea of publishing kindly um mm-hmm. and yeah did that surprise you? I feel like I'm carrying on now. Did that surprise you, <laughs> the level of um, care that you have to have on that, on a humanitarian level when it comes to publishing? Do you know what? I, I'm trying to think back to when I first started. I think perhaps, perhaps not. I think ultimately it's uh, an industry that revolves around like without authors there is no industry so also like obviously like the most important thing we have to make sure that we're looking after you right so yeah I walked into it with that mindset and knowing that and I should also say the first place that I worked you know they had really great author care and it was great to work somewhere that were from the jump you know that was part and parcel of the conversation I think an interesting part is you know some of the authors I've worked with without agents is how much more of a pastoral role that you take as an editor when they don't have an agent I mean it's great to have that really close relationship I think making sure again that that communication and and care is sort of doubled to replace (laughs) that agent role is is super important does that answer the question properly it does no no, it it does because I think you know there's so many different roles roles and professions that we can go into Mm. and you just think about the um like the spec list aspect mm. of it you know the job specifications mm. and it's only when you're in it you think of actually there's more to this role than, than just you know getting a book out or mm. you know, when I was being a solicitor just representing someone and just getting a good sentence from mm. you know to a good result I should say um mm. you, you then you realize there's so much more of a, hum, of a humanitarian aspect yeah. you're, actually dealing, you're dealing with people you're dealing with their emotions you really are, you yeah. really are. I think if anything I think what surprised me the most is not just how much that's important in your author relationship, but mm-hmm. particularly as an editor, how much that's important in your relationship with like other teams, people outside, like particularly in trad, um, but across every play- publisher I've worked at, you know, as the editor, if you want to get your book like certain level of marketing, you need to make sure you're keeping the marketing and happy, happy, keep the sales team happy, keep the publicity team happy. You know, if you want to get your this bookshop to support your book, have you taken that them out to lunch recently? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> No, but it is, you know, it's such it's such a business of relationships and getting people to do favours for you. Oh, hey, you don't have budget for that, you know, on a cover, going to the designer and being like, look, because you've been nice to them and establish a relationship, like, please can you do this cheaper for me? <laughs> because I really I know I want the quality of your work. There is a lot of a uh, sort of big warrants dealing. So you just have to be a nice well, I say you have to be a nice person, not everyone is. Luckily where I work, everyone's delightful and yeah. actually all the jobs I've had. Maybe I'm too much of Pollyanna and I've just got my rose tips as well. Everywhere I've worked, I've had a really lovely time. I've been very very fortunate but I'm, I'm I'm aware that not everyone is lovely but I think that sort of travels too and people start to yeah. avoid you like a bad smell if that's the case so yeah well no they do if they're not if you're yeah. just business men, you mm. know just just walk around you yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, around. A wall, like an invisible force you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so what's your plans for the future before we say goodbye <laughs> oh I am I'm, I'm keen to buy some more exciting projects for the Orion Fiction List um you know I think obviously my love has been crime thriller mystery suspense for a long time so finding some ex- exciting things in that area growing some initiatives to find more underrepresented voices for Orion probably as a whole would be great um yeah. I should say that Orion's been doing a really wonderful job 
on that I've noticed in the past few years and also it's the most diverse place I've ever worked <laughs> certainly in the editorial teams I should say you know I'm not like the only black person in editorial <laughs> there are other black people wow that's genuinely never happened before so <laughs> great um but yeah 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 I guess Just I had on one point. more there was one question I was supposed to ask you oh. <laughs> I always, always have one more question how did it feel <laughs> when the bookseller Announced you as a rising star in 2021. Oh, that's such a nice question. Oh, it was, it was <laughs> lovely, isn't it? It's lovely. And I think particularly then, you know, I've been working at um, imprints that I kind of, you know, there's not a lot of noise made about them in the industry. They, you know, publish some books that make some good money. But, you know, I felt like I was hidden in a little, hidden, hidden in a little hole. So it was nice to see that oh. actually. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, um, yeah, the recognition was it's really lovely. But ultimately, you know, in the grand scheme of things, oh God, I don't want to say this to preclude myself from getting any future <laughs> nominations. Ultimately, <laughs> that kind of thing is meaning meaningless, right? I think at the end of the day, I sort of judge myself by the standards of how happy my authors are, how happy my colleagues are in working with me, um, and how much money my, my books are making. So <laughs> may that continue to to go brilliantly for me, I hope. <laughs> I hope so too. And finally, if anyone wants to find you, Leo Dora oh, Darlington, yeah. how can I find you? online i would say despite the fact that it seems like it's maybe burning down twitter is probably the best place to find <laughs> me it's leodora underscore and that's it fortunately thank my mum for choosing a reasonably unique name, or <laughs> of a name um yeah hopefully it doesn't disappear anytime soon but if it does i'm sure i will tweet about where i'll be moving to leodora darlington thank you for being part of the conversation oh it's been my pleasure thank you for being <laughs> such a wonderful host and for having me Hopefully people enjoy listening to my rambling. (laughs) Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Conversation. I'll be back next Tuesday with a new episode. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss out on the next episode or any bonus episodes. And it would mean a lot if you took a minute to leave a review. You can follow me on social media. My links are on my website, nadinematheson.com. And if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, email theconversation at nadinematheson.com. See you soon.